Lucius Marcius Philippus, Consul 91 BCE. Known primarily for his work in derailing the reform attempts of Livius Drusus the Younger, Philippus is, unlike many other obstructionists in Roman history, quite significant in his own right. After his consulship, he went on to be a major player in Roman politics for about 15 or so more years. In this video, I will lay out the course of Philippus's career, explain why he is sometimes cited as an example of a scholarly theory, and why he is someone we should think about when we try to understand the politics of this period. The Marcii Philippi were a pretty well-connected plebeian family. They would qualify as noble since they had ancestors who had held the consulship. However, that being said, this was not an overly common name in the Roman world, and they weren't one of the truly great houses. Aquintus Marcius had become consul in the year 281, so this seems like a reasonable start point for when this family entered the circle of nobility. As for the first person to bear the name Marcius Philippus, that would be another Quintus who served as consul in 186. This person is actually fairly interesting. He is mostly famous for losing in a large-scale battle against the Ligurians to the northeast of Italy, but then later, nearly 20 years later, he served as censor in 164. As I've commented on many occasions, victory and defeat in Rome did not necessarily determine one's position within the pecking order of the Senate, since it was typical for Roman elites to cast blame for military failure on the men rather than their commanders. The maternal grandfather of Lucius Marcius Philippus was one of the countless men named Appius Claudius Polcare. This one was consul in 143, and he represents the ancestor of our Philippus, who was the most recent person to hold the consulship. Philippus's parents were Polcare's daughter, Claudia Polcra, and Quintus Marcius Philippus who does not seem to have had much of a political career. He may very well have had one of some kind, but there are no surviving attestations to such a career. Lucius had an older brother who bore the sort of dominant name within the family of Quintus Marcius Philippus. This older brother was most likely born around 143 or so and died around 105. So, his brother doesn't seem to have had a political career. This meant that once Lucius Marcius Philippus came of age, the burden of restoring the family to prominence in Roman politics fell upon him. Philippus was a highly educated man and someone who had a broad range of intellectual interest. He was said to have been especially well versed in Greek literature. That was especially something unique since in his generation, there weren't all that many Hellenophiles. In earlier and later generations of elite Romans, there were people who were very much interested in Greek culture, but for whatever reason, most of Philippus' contemporaries were not that interested. His interest in all things Greek made him stand out and was seen as a little bit unusual. However, his interest in books no doubt helped him to become a better orator, to have a broader range of reference, and to be able to really study the works of Greek orators and learn from them. Philippus, unlike some other speakers, was not known for his preparation for speeches. Unlike, say, Hortensius and Cicero, he did not sit down and write out speeches or rehearse them or practice his gestures. He was known for speaking extemporaneously, and he did so with great skill. However, because he was acting on an impromptu basis against opponents who were much better prepared, he often struggled to get going and sometimes could stumble over his words, especially at the beginning. Especially as an old man, Philippus despised Hortensius's studied, rehearsed speeches and hand gestures. Philippus was, I guess, more natural, and it's also possible that since he grew up in an era 
when Romans were not all that interested in Greek culture, he tried to affect a more sort of off-the-cuff, um, bluff Roman style. Um, Romans, before they interacted with the Greeks, did not have a very elaborate um, system of oration. People spoke rather plainly in comparison to the more polished orators who had learned their craft from Greek models. While we don't really have any surviving examples of Philippus's oratorical displays, we do know that his reputation for eloquence continued at least into the Augustan era. We first hear of Philippus in 104 when he served as tribune. If he followed something like the Cursus Honorum, then he most likely was around 30 years old at this time, or perhaps just a bit older. He was determined to make an impact using his oratorical brilliance. Just like many tribunes of this period, he recognized that there was a problem when it came to Romans being landless and effectively jobless because they didn't have that land to farm. He proposed land reform and an agrarian bill. The details are unknown as to exactly what he proposed, but it seems like there was sort of a standard thing to propose at this time. He made a memorable public statement during his attempt to pass this bill that there were not more than 2,000 men in the state who possessed any real property. That seems to have struck a nerve, and this is one of the very few things that he said that has been preserved. Philippus seems to have introduced this legislation to gain popularity, and he dropped it quickly when the Senate showed no interest in passing it. Unlike many other tribunes, Philippus had no intention of ever defying or in any way challenging the authority of the Senate to legislate. A year after Philippus served as tribune, Rome elected Lucius Apuleius Saturninus to serve as one of the ten men filling the board of the tribunes. Perhaps inspired by the half-hearted failures of Philippus and others to enact change, Saturninus used the assemblies to pass legislation in 103 as the Gracchi had done 20 and 30 years earlier. In 100, Philippus gives us an indication of his feelings about such a practice because he was among the men who participated in killing Saturninus and Glaucia. Because of the way that Philippus used the tribuneship to get his name out there, and clearly did not believe in passing legislation through the assemblies, scholars have come to believe that his career and others like it show us what, quote, normal was for Roman politicians during this period. Some scholars have come to believe that posing as a popularist and making half-hearted reform proposals was an accepted and normal political tactic by men who were trying to gain name recognition. If you'll recall, Philippus's family was reasonably well-known and certainly not obscure, but they were not one of the biggest houses in Rome. We know from studying Roman election results that the more famous your family name, the more likely you are to succeed when you are running for office. The thing that put a tribune proposing legislation out of step with the norm, under this theory especially, was not proposing legislation, but actually going through with pushing reforms through the assembly against the will of the Senate. Because of this, despite the fact that both Philippus and Saturninus were classified as populares, and both of them seemed to propose some somewhat comparable things, uh, Philippus remained in good standing with the Senate throughout his career, whereas Saturninus was branded a public enemy and effectively persecuted after 103 for the rest of his career. So um, I don't know if this theory is one that completely holds water. Of course, our evidence is limited, but it does bear mentioning here, and it's something that you should think about. Philippus first became eligible for the consulship in 93. He ran for that year, but was defeated. In 91, however, Philippus ran, and this time he won. Most likely, he used his oratorical skills in public settings, and especially in the law courts, to impress voters, and that additional fame helped him to then 
gained enough name recognition to win the consulship. His patrician colleague in 91 was Sextus Julius Caesar, the uncle of Gaius Julius Caesar, the future dictator. The year 91 was dominated completely by the actions of the tribune Marcus Livius Drusus the Younger and his attempts at reform. Although he is ostensibly a popularis according to our sources, Philippus was actually the leader of the opposition to Drusus and his attempts at reform. How could this be? This doesn't seem right. Well, let's take a look at what Drusus was proposing and who his chief backers were. Reform in Rome from the late second century forward was extremely difficult and would meet with intense opposition. Most of the time when we hear about a tribune trying to change the way that things operate in Rome, the majority of the Senate is against this person, or at least there is a very vocal and sometimes violent opposition from a strong faction. However, in the case of Livius Drusus, he came in with the bulk of the Senate behind him, including a lot of very prominent people. Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, the princeps senatus, was a prominent and vocal supporter of what Livius Drusus wanted to accomplish. Lucius Licinius Crassus, the um, greatest orator of that era, and someone who was also of consular status, was a major fan of what Livius Drusus was trying to accomplish. Drusus's reforms, to put them in a nutshell, were aimed at shoring up the authority of the Senate. He was in no sense a popularis, unlike almost all of the other famous tribunes who attempted to act as reformers. Philippus therefore found himself in a strange and unprecedented spot, and he seems to have been very much in the minority because of it. So he, someone who identified at this time as a popularis, was opposing reform from a tribune, and even though he was the consul ostensibly defending the state, most of the people within the state were in favor of the reforms being proposed by the tribune. This must have seemed topsy-turvy and even insane in Rome at this time, since for the last 30 plus years, it had always been the case that the tribunes were pushing for reforms and the Senate as a body was mostly opposing those reforms. Things had gone crazy. Due to the strong support that he enjoyed in the Senate, Drusus attempted to pass his legislation through that body. Philippus's opposition, however, made this very difficult. At one point, while Philippus was engaging in obstructionism, Crassus jumped to the defense of young Drusus and defended his legislation vigorously. This resulted in an exchange between the sitting consul Philippus and the former consul Crassus. If Cicero was correct, then Crassus was the greatest orator of the time and Philippus was about the third greatest. So this was a high level and intense debate. Eventually, however, it got personal and nasty. Crassus effectively said that Philippus's conduct had proven him to be unworthy of his consular office and that he was illegitimate. Of course, that is something that could constitute fighting words. Philippus fired back by impugning Crassus's career and his status as a loyal senator. Violence of some unspecified nature, I presume a fist fight, spilled over into the forum and had to be broken up. Now, for the most part, Crassus was on the more popular side, and he seems to have gotten the better of the exchange in terms of public opinion. A week later, uh, uh, Crassus died of natural causes, presumably completely unrelated to the fracas in the Senate. And one has to imagine that because Philippus and Crassus had had such a nasty exchange at the end, and Crassus died such a well-respected man, that this further put Philippus in the doghouse of most senators. So this was really the low point of 91 so far as Philippus was concerned. He had almost no prestige within the Senate and no one took him seriously as consul anymore. 
After Crassus's death, one of the major supporters of Drusus in the Senate was gone. However, the majority of the body was still more favorably inclined toward Drusus than toward Philippus. Despite his popularity and prestige being at a low ebb, however, Philippus persisted and tried his best to prevent Drusus's legislation. He apparently was able to completely persuade Drusus that trying to pass anything through the Senate was a non-starter. Drusus therefore resorted to trying to pass bills through the Assembly, and Philippus decided that it would be a good idea to go to the Forum and try to prevent voting from occurring. Philippus apparently didn't realize just how unpopular he was with the general public, however. When he was there getting on Drusus's nerves, Drusus simply ordered his clients to arrest and jail the consul. Whether or not Drusus intended for it to happen, the angry men in his entourage beat Philippus, bloodying him, and then dragged him by the throat to jail. It looks like there was some overreach by Drusus who overestimated his own popularity and his own righteousness. He also perhaps simply underestimated exactly how much weight Roman senators attached to respect for authority. Whatever you might think of Philippus personally, he was the sitting consul and as such should be treated with respect and dignity, and certainly not beaten within an inch of his life by an angry mob incited by a junior official. Despite this severe beating, Philippus's ordeal caused the Senate's sympathy to swing decisively against Drusus. So, ironically, it was this severe ass-whipping which restored Philippus's prestige and gave him a real shot at achieving his goal of undermining reform. Knowing that the tide of Senate opinion had shifted decisively in his favor, Philippus used his authority as an augur to declare that the violence which had attended Drusus's reform attempts was an omen of disapproval and warning from the gods, and that this legislation was therefore illegitimate and needed to be repealed to put Rome back on the right path with the gods. Um, I assume that one of the things that he would include as a violent uh, occasion which shows the disapproval of the gods was when he and Crassus came to blows in the Senate, something that had almost nothing to do with Livius Drusus the Younger. At any rate, Drusus knew that his stock had fallen and that resistance to this would be futile. The Senate was persuaded and declared Drusus's legislation null and void. Drusus, for his part, backed away from his land reform and instead focused on the issue of extending citizenship to the Socii, the Latin and Italian allies of Rome who served in the ranks but did not enjoy the full privileges of citizenship. This was a controversial issue as many of the Roman plebs thought that their own uh, rights would be undermined or diluted by including more people. However, the Latins and Italians were deeply insistent that they be included and they were preparing to revolt if necessary to secure their rights. Drusus was, of course, assassinated in the fall of 91, and when he was assassinated, this caused the social war to break out. Trying to assess any blame for his assassination to Philippus directly is probably unwise. However, if Drusus's stock had not been damaged by Philippus's constant opposition, it's possible that Drusus could have used his prestige and goodwill to push through the citizenship for Latins and Italians and that Rome could have avoided the social war. So I think Philippus does deserve a little bit of the blame for the social war, but again, um, this was a reform that should have happened a long time before, and there are many, many Romans who should be blamed in some way for not including their allies um, in their citizenship program earlier. Uh, most senators were willing to overlook the demands of the Italians, and this ended up costing them big time since they had to fight a very costly and bloody civil war. 
Despite being the sitting consul at the time when the social war broke out, Philippus's actions during that conflict are completely unknown. It's even possible that he didn't command anything during the entire three-year stretch of the war. Also, when Marius and Sulla went to war with one another in 88, Philippus also stayed neutral. When Senna took over in Rome while Sulla was away in the east fighting Mithridates, Philippus decided to work with Senna. In 87, Gnaeus Pompeius Strabo died. He left his estate to his 20-something-year-old son Pompey, we call him Pompey the Great, but young Pompey faced charges relating to his father's actions. The charge was that his father had stolen public money when he had been consul two years earlier. Philippus took it upon himself to defend young Pompey's inheritance, and he was able to fend off the charges from his great rival in the courts, Hortensius, and therefore Pompey was able to receive a massive estate, and he would be in a position when Sulla came home to give Sulla an army and rise to prominence in his own right. So Philippus, by this court case, defeated someone who was considered a better orator in Hortensius and managed to promote Pompey's career. Supposedly, Philippus was secretly favoring Pom uh, Sulla the entire time, but if so, he didn't reveal his hand. It's also possible that he was secretly won over at some point prior to 83, and that that uh, that is when he decided to become a Sulan. Maybe he and Sulla made some sort of an arrangement. It's not entirely clear. Um, Philippus is someone who's a little bit hard to pin down when it comes to exactly what his politics were and who his allies were. In 86, Philippus served as censor alongside of Marcus Perperna. If he was indeed a known Solon sympathizer, then his appointment could represent an attempt by Senna to win over both Philippus and other senior senators who might otherwise prefer Sulla. The censorship is a rare honor under any circumstances, and it does represent a notch even above the consulship. Although the circumstances under which he held it are a little bit suspect, uh, Sulla was away in the east and there was sort of an unofficial and not quite acknowledged state of civil war in the Roman world, nonetheless, his censorship was still something that he could be proud of. Philippus was apparently a very strict censor, and he even expelled his own maternal uncle from the Senate for unknown reasons. To return for a moment to Philippus's allegiance at this time, it is possible that he was a dedicated follower of Senna. Perhaps when Senna died in 84, Philippus was upset that he was not his primary heir and that the chief role went instead to Papirius Carbo. Whatever his reasons for doing so, whether he was outraged at not being the main successor to Senna, or because he actually had uh, sympathized with Sulla all along, Philippus decided to rush to Sulla's side in the year 83 when he landed in Italy. Rather than fighting alongside of Sulla in Italy proper, Philippus was dispatched as a legate and was able to secure Sardinia for the Solan cause. He and Sulla apparently established a very close friendship once the two men returned to Rome. After Sulla's prescriptions took out many senior senators, Philippus found himself as one of the oldest and highest ranking men who were left in that body. When Sulla died in 78, there was a grand state funeral and there were several eulogists. However, the honor of delivering the main eulogy fell to Philippus. After Sulla's death, there was a distinct lack of leadership among the Solans, or there would have been had Philippus not been alive and active. When Marcus Aemilius Lepidus the Elder led a revolt against the Solan order in 77, it was up to Philippus to organize a resistance. The two consuls of the year were fairly weak, as we'll see in a moment. 
But it was Philippus who proposed to the Senate that they pass the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, and then he called on Quintus Catulus, who would later become the Princeps Senatus, and Pompey the Great to put down the rebel Lepidus. The incident of Lepidus's rebellion is now something of a footnote and a not very well understood one at that. However, it was a major crisis since the Solon Order was without a clear leader. Philippus emerged as that leader at a time when there weren't any other major players who were ready for prime time. Even after Lepidus was defeated in early to mid-77, the two consuls in office and the Senate as a whole was still rather diffident and relied heavily on Philippus's advice to find its way. Later that year, Quintus Sertorius's revolt in Spain became serious enough that it warranted the sending of a consular army. The problem was that neither of the sitting consuls, Mamercus Livianus, nor Decimus Junius Brutus, wanted any part in a Spanish campaign. Campaigns in Spain tended to be long, brutal, and unprofitable. Philippus therefore proposed sending Pompey in their stead. His famous quip from this debate was, I give my vote to send him not as a proconsul, but instead of the consuls. This was not only a sick burn against the two negligent consuls, but was also a statement which playfully hints at Pompey's extraordinary role within the Solon Constitution, which did not in any way allow for someone like Pompey to exist. Pompey was still too young to meet the minimum age requirements of the higher offices within the Senate, I believe at this point he'd be in his early 30s, but he was still well south of the minimum age requirements for both the praetorship and the consulship, the two ranks at which one would actually command field forces. So this quip works on all levels, and that's probably why of all the things that Philippus ever said, this is the thing that got recorded and has been preserved to the present. It's good that he went out on this quip because this was also his last attested public act. It would appear that after 77, other senators in Rome were able to get their stuff together and began to assert themselves as leaders. Philippus remained active in the Senate, but he didn't do anything else that we're aware of. In 73 BCE, Philippus passed away. While he will probably rarely be mentioned as anything more, than the guy who opposed Livius Drusus the Younger. Lucius Marcius Philippus was actually one of the most significant men of his time, and he has gained more significance in modern times due to debates over how Roman factionalism functioned. His career, among others, has been used as an example of how popularis was actually a style of political branding for young politicians on the make. I think that there's a lot of validity to this argument, and certainly that seems to best explain Philippus's actions. That being said, I don't think that it does explain other politicians in Rome who did use the Office of Tribune to legitimately try to pass legislation. His successful battle against Drusus's reforms had the effect of both weakening the ability of tribunes to reform through the legislative assemblies and it helped to spur on the social war. As I mentioned earlier, had Drusus kept his prestige and not lost the battle against Philippus, he most likely would have been able to pull off some kind of reform that would have prevented the social war by granting citizenship to Latin and Italian allies. I've pointed it out a couple times, but Philippus also promoted Pompey's interest and career at a couple of key points. In 87, when Pompey was inheriting his father's estate, it was Philippus who made sure that Pompey was not forced to relinquish that estate due to his father's alleged crimes. Another weird thing about Philippus that we know is that he had famously luxurious habits. He was one of the first Romans to start building fish ponds and engaging in other excesses. 
Apparently, this behavior rubbed off on younger people like Lucullus and Hortensius. By the way, unlike the relationship between Hortensius and Cicero, who became friends, it does not appear that Philippus and Hortensius ever saw eye to eye, mostly because Philippus saw Hortensius as a pretentious douchebag. But that is another story for another day.